triangle, tetrahedron, octahedron, icosahedron, triangles that grow, unfold, and become spheres. Structures built on the principle of the 60 degree angle. These buildings have appeared around the globe over the past decades as part of the work of one man, R. Buckminster Fuller. A man who sees the world as something more than the sum of its parts. Fuller once said, I did not set out to design a house that hung from a pole or to manufacture a new type of automobile, invent a new system of map projection, develop geodesic domes or energetic geometry. I started with the universe as an organization of regenerative principles frequently manifest as energy systems of which all our experiences and possible experiences are only local instances. I could have ended up with a pair of flying slippers. Instead of flying slippers, he did all of those things he did not set out to do. And to accompany them, he invented a new vocabulary. He was forced to find new meanings for old words, sometimes to coin new ones. Because the concepts behind his ideas of the universe did not fit the usual definitions and patterns and he subjects the definitions of others to penetrating scrutiny. The Massachusetts Institute of Technology Department of Mathematics has a very accurate definition of mathematics, of course, and their definition is fairly long, but the first sentence of it is, mathematics, which most people think of as the science of number, is in fact the science of structure and pattern in general. The ideas of structure that men have are not very sound as we see popularly because people build buildings with great squares and cubes and we discover that squares and cubes are highly distortable. Therefore they take a whole lot of, of secondary triangular reinforcing. I'm going to think about structure in the terms of what I call, I call the ways in which things energy of universe associates most logically and the way energy dissociates. Association of, with association is a powerful word. I have two forms here which, which are identical forms and I've given these to mathematical audiences a number of times and asked them to put these two pieces together in a logical manner. And they will take these two quadrangles and they try addressing them and they say, is that what you mean? I say, no, that's not what I mean. And so they take the two triangular ends, they try addressing those. They take the trapezoids and they try putting those together. And they can't seem to find any logical way of bringing, bringing this, these symmetrical triangles and the, the uh, trapezoids are asymmetrical, and these quadrangles. The fact is that what we want to do is to rotate one of these like this. Notice that this has five balls and this has four balls. We ro want to rotate one of them like this and then bring it in like this and then it sit together and becomes a tetrahedron. And that is because, you see the five balls here, four balls here. What is going on here is not a 90 degree association, which is the way most people tend to think in the terms of just clapping their hands, but one is, is pinching on the other. There's a convergence and divergence, and the fundamental structures of nature are not on in, uh, associating in the terms of 90 degreeness, but usually in the terms of the such 60 degreeness. So the customary view of structure is not Fuller's. In order to understand his view, it's vital to look at his vocabulary. Almost synonymous with him in the mind of the public is the word dimaxion, coined from dynamism, maximum, and ions, 
and given to the Dymaxion House in 1927. The word boils down to mean doing the most with the least. The Dymaxion apartment was designed along the same wire wheel tension principle as the house. The hexagonal deck planes were suspended by tension cables from a central tower. Fuller sketched a tower garage built on Dymaxion principles and suggested it as an exhibit for the 1933 Chicago World's Fair. The accompanying note read in part, a tower support and self-operating elevator to circles of parking. Separate ramps for up and down. Floors entirely supported by cables overhead. Could be made a hundred decks high and be colossally beautiful. Structures were not the only Dymaxion inventions. Fuller envisioned an omnidirectional vehicle which he called his 4D transport. He described it to his young daughter as a zoomobile. It could hop off the road at will, fly about, then settle back into place in traffic. While these first inventions were never produced, many Dymaxion developments have reached the market. The Dymaxion car incorporated many of the features of the 4D transport. It had a cigar-shaped nose in front of a teardrop silhouette for minimum air resistance. The car was multi-hinged and multi-springed and offered maximum comfort to the 11 passengers who could speed along at 120 miles per hour. Three Dymaxion cars were produced in the early 1930s, but they were considered far too radical for mass consumption. Since that time, many of their features have been incorporated into contemporary automotive design. A dozen prototypes of the die-stamped Dymaxion bathroom were produced. The unit was composed of four basic pieces. Complete, the whole interior appeared to be one surface without angles or curves. It occupied a floor space, five feet by five feet, and weighed 420 pounds, about as much as one cast-finished porcelain tub. Like a refrigerator, the bathroom could be installed in a few minutes. Once the prefabricated manifolds of intake, vent, and waste pipes were connected, the bathroom was ready for use. The first of Fuller's products to be mass-produced was the Dymaxion Deployment Unit. Incorporating many of the principles of the Dymaxion House, the unit was a conversion of a corrugated grain storage bin. The standard top was replaced with a compound curvature roof, and skylights, ventilators, porthole windows, and a door were added. Walls and ceilings were lined with fiberglass-backed wallboard. Fuller felt the bin design was the most efficient engineering unit available at that time, 1940, for small, prefabricated houses. The cost of less than one dollar per square foot was 80 percent under that of competitive construction. Using the Dymaxion deployment unit, the United States Army Signal Corps and Air Corps were able to have the first radar operating huts light enough to be flown and simple enough to be speedily assembled. Hundreds saw service in the Pacific and Persian Gulf during World War II. Full application of the Dymaxion principles came with the Wichita House of 1945-46. Developed for the post-war conversion of the aircraft industry to housing purposes and produced at the Beach Aircraft Plant at Wichita, Kansas, the house was engineered using aircraft tools and assembly line techniques as a full-scale pilot model for a production run. It was an aluminum, steel, and plexiglass structure suspended from a central mast, just as the 1927 Dymaxion house. The 22-foot mast, formed of seven three-inch stainless steel tubes, weighed 72 pounds and was capable of carrying the entire weight of the house and that of 120 people. The interior was divided into two bedrooms, each with its own bath, a living room, kitchen, and entry hall with garage space below. Household mechanics, such as laundry, dishwashing facilities, were centralized around the mast. The total weight of the structure was 6,000 pounds, and all component parts could be packed into a single cylinder for delivery. In limited mass production, the house would have retailed at $6,500. Full volume production would have cut the cost to 3700 and 3,700 purchase, 37 purchase applications were signed, but with the end of the war, funds were diverted elsewhere and the initial financing was not raised. No flying slippers here in these Dymaxion inventions. Another new phrase appeared with Fuller's evolution of a mathematical system, synergetic, energetic geometry. It was developed as Fuller looked for a more rational, coordinate geometry as the working basis for his structures. 
He uses the word energetic to refer to separated and individual working parts of a system. Synergetic is used to define the manner in which a whole system acts as more than the simple sum of its parts, as an alloy may contain qualities apparent in none of its constituents. Synergetic energetic geometry is more than a mathematical system. As its applications appear in diverse natural phenomena, it provides a clue to what may be nature's basic coordinate system. That system, once established, would be a major step toward eliminating the gaps between particular sciences and the much ballyhooed one between science and the humanities. The rift began a century and a half ago when the mathematicians became disconsolate over the fact that the early Greek philosophers, particularly Plato, the, the scientist philosophers had attempted to explain physical phenomena, to explain nature by geometry. The geometry, the geometrical explanations of Plato had proven to be uh, un unsound. And because of that, the mathematicians really developed a, I, I, I say, almost an inferiority complex. They, they suddenly were chagrined. Then, about a century ago, we began to have some microscopic capability. Crystal, crystallography began, and the physical scientists said to the mathematicians, we seem to see some geometrical forms here. Can you not tie up your mathematics with our geometry? The mathematicians, not being physical scientists, really didn't understand what was going on, and having been warned by the earlier behavior of the Greeks, decided to go exactly in the opposite direction from explaining the reality, and they retreated deliberately into complete abstraction. They said they were going after great purity of the generalized case of mathematics, but uh, I, I think that while they unquestionably had a great integrity about their desire to get the pure generalized case, complete abstraction, they also tended to be motivated really emotionally by their, their fear of uh, falling in the same uh, inadequacy that the early Greeks had. Therefore, I feel that the mathematicians took their point of departure off into a complete abstraction and purity a little too early. They took, it, they took off from a classical physics. They took off from a Newtonian world. And as we all know, the, the Einsteinian world has, has replaced many of the fundamental axioms, the fundamental ways of looking at things. Primarily, Newton's idea that a body persisted in a state of rest or secondarily in a line of motion except as affected by other bodies. The Newtonian world, the great classical world, the Victorian world, up to right to Einstein, found the, uh, the static to be the normal. No change was normal. Einsteinian went, uh, Einstein took us in exactly the opposite direction over into a universe in which uh, extraordinary motion was normal, the, uh, where the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second approximately, became the norm. And from this time on, we were in a universe of con continual transitions, transformations, and the Greek geometry was obviously extremely inadequate, and the mathematicians were very glad that they had departed early from that scene because they wouldn't. They tended to deal when they dealt in geometry at all as a static geometry. The, the static geometry, the Greeks had had no no heat, no weight, no time dimension, no longevity. Therefore, it did not exist in any physical sense. So that the, the we can say that the Greek geometers had been really abstract and pure, but it was the Greek natural philosophers who had made the mistake of trying to identify that geometry. In order to then to see the dilemma that the mathematicians had left us in, we see that having taken their departure from a Newtonian static, they had <coughs> gone off just a little too early. So in order to, 
to, to have a body of mathematics, you have to have some prime points of departure. We call those the axioms. And what the mathematicians have taken to be self-evident truths which were, could not be proven, which would be their points of departure, the axioms, have, I feel, been quite inadequate. They were, they were relatively static ones. And I'm going to try to examine some of the great differences between what you would have to, do, to have as proper axioms in order to make the mathematics uh, suitable for the explanation of the physical phenomena. If the mathematics could explain the physical phenomena, then the great chasm between science and humanities would be closed. Why? Because conceptuality would return to science, as it is now, even though the scientists are dealing with things like crystals and with viruses, with, with human beings, which we all say are perfectly conceptual, the, the mathematics with which the scientist has had to, to operate ha will recognize no conceptuality, no model. They said models were invalid, all kind of this Greek fiasco. And therefore, if conceptuality could be, could be brought back into the mathematics, quite clearly then, the writers, the authors, would have something to write about. An author has to have a, a model to describe in order to be able to, to talk to the public. And, they, and the writers have been the liaison men, theoretically, between the science and the humanities, and we've taken away them, their models. So if conceptuality can be found to be returnable to the mathematics, then we can say that the science, that what science is doing can be understood conceptually, and then the humanities can then re rejoin the examination of our total experience. Models reflect the axioms and are the teaching tools of synergetic, energetic geometry. For Fuller, the figure called a vector equilibrium, the 14-sided figure which occurs when as many spheres as possible are packed around a central sphere, is a key structure. He uses a device which he calls the jitterbug to show that the linear extract of this figure can change size and shape without changing the length of any of its members. The 14-sided figure becomes an 8-sided one called an octahedron. Further manipulated, the octahedron becomes the tetrahedron, the three-dimensional figure with the least possible number of surfaces. The four-faced tetrahedron is the figure which encloses the least amount of space with the most surface area. Since the sphere encloses the most space with the least surface, Fuller surmised that the most economical structure might be derived through a fusion of the tetrahedron and the sphere. By using the acosahedron, a multi-phase tetrahedron, all of whose vertices lie on the surface of the sphere, Fuller arrived at the great grid of the geodesic structure. Geodesic, another Fuller reactivated word. It literally means the shortest distance between two points on a curved or spherical surface. In geodesic structures, there are no inherent size limitations. As the system grows, the frequency of triangulation increases. Its relative strength grows at a faster rate than the weight of the structure. So it grows relatively lighter and stronger as the size increases. Geodesic domes have been manufactured from many sorts of material. Fiberglass, the ray domes built for use on the Arctic dew line. They are required to withstand 210 mile per hour winds and to be permeable to radar beams. Paper, the domes produced for the Marine Corps. The six-man domes were one-third the weight of a six-man tent, cost one-fifteenth as much, used less than ten dollars worth of materials, and packed into a small carrying case. Plexiglass and aluminum tubing, the Climatron, the Missouri Botanical Garden in St. Louis. 70 feet high, 175 feet in diameter, it contains a ground surface of over one half acre. Two individual air conditioning systems allow the maintenance of several different climates within the Climatron. The hottest area corresponds to a tropical lowland jungle where an Amazon forest and bog area have been built. Little Hawaii has cool days and warm nights similar to oceanic climate regions. 
Here the most colorful tropical flowers grow. A tropical mountain forest climate surrounds the waterfall region. Lush vegetation from near the equator thrives within this dome in the northern temperate region. Aluminum, the 145-foot diameter Kaiser Auditorium in Honolulu. It was built in 22 hours, and a concert with the Hawaiian Symphony Orchestra was held in it just 24 hours after the dome's components arrived on the island. Nuts, bolts, aluminum discs, a plan for a geodesic dome, all combine with aluminum tubing and rubberized plastic to manufacture a 42-foot diameter utility structure. The five hours of construction condensed into 25 seconds reveals how six men can assemble the hemisphere. These domes have been used for storage, shelter, and exhibition pavilions around the world. Quite different usage of nuts, bolts, and joints appear in another type of fuller construction. That based on the tensegrity principle. Beneath what seems to be magically supported structures lie the same axioms that explain the structure of balloons, fishnets, and molecules. Where the individual compression struts do not touch one another, yet hold the tension network outwardly in firm patterning. We talk about pneumatic bags. That's another kind of a structure, an automobile tire. And we look at the pneumatic bag, and we look at the microscope very carefully, and we suddenly discover it's full of holes. And as much as it is full of holes, we suddenly have to say, well, it is not a, something we really meant by a film. We used to, when we said film, we sort of fooled ourselves into thinking something that was continuous and impervious, a continuous plane. And we just, the, in as much as it's full of holes, we really have to say a pneumatic bag is really a network. It is a net, but the net is so, uh, the mesh in the net is so small that it's too small for the individual molecules of gas to go out through. So that the the net holds the mole molecules of gas very much the way a fish net holds a fish. But very very much the same way because the molecules of gas are literally trying to impinge against the the bag, and it is an impingement of of the molecules against the bag that push the bag outwardly. It occurred to me a long time ago that I might be able to take a pneumatic bag and, and hollow it out, just leaving the molecules that hit the, hit the bag hit, hitting the bag. You say, well, the, other, those molecules will get loose in, in the center where you've hollowed it out. And, and I, I point out to you that the tensegrity structure is just such an arrangement. Each one of the compression struts in the tensegrity uh, in the tensegrity spheres, these islands of compression as, as struts, each end of them are pushing out against the tensional net, just exactly as the two of the molecules acting, pushing off of each other like two swimmers in the middle of a tank could push off from each other's feet in opposite directions. We find the two molecules push off from each other, each hit the bag and push the bag outwardly. They hit it in a glancing blow. In order to get them stable, we have to get them crossing each other in triangles, and that's what we do in the tensegrity structure. So that we find then that, the, the, here is another part of that consideration. We said the tension is trying to hold the, com the compression members in, keeps these individual molecules or struts from pushing outwardly. In a high frequency tensegrity structure, the ends of each member literally seem to touch the middle of the next. This 72-foot diameter experimental basketry dome was built by design students on the campus of Southern Illinois University. It is large enough to hold a five-floor building with 20,000 square feet of floor space. Yet it is made of only $450 worth of lumber and hardware. Like geodesic structures, tensegrity structures can be made in virtually limitless sizes. The larger they become, the stronger they are. Looking into the future, Fuller has calculated tensegrity structures up to two miles in diameter. 
A dome of this size could cover most of Upper Manhattan. Weighing about 80,000 tons, it could be assembled in five-ton sections by helicopters and would cost about $200 million. He believes that the savings to the city in air conditioning, street cleaning, and snow removal would soon repay the initial investment. Only electrically powered motor vehicles would be allowed in the dome-covered city, thus gasoline and diesel fumes would be eliminated. Aspension Tensegrity Domes are another project for the future. The plans for a number to be built in Japan, one 750 feet in diameter, call for them to be factory woven like great fishnets. An Aspension Dome would rise synergetically on site from its folded form by the outward pulling of a base ring. The fuller world is one of unique insights. Even its cartography displays its demand for precision, accuracy, and invention. The Dymaxion Air Ocean Map is the first chart to show the whole surface of the Earth in a single view, with virtually imperceptible distortion in relative shapes and sizes of land and sea masses. It is a topological transfer of Fuller's triangulated systems from the surface of a sphere to the equivalent space on the faces of a three-dimensional figure, the same process employed in synergetic energetic geometry. Unpeeling this solid and laying the skin flat gives the surface of the map. On the Dymaxion map, the Earth's surface is one great continental archipelago, lying within one world ocean. This view of the world as a unity with all sections connected to and dependent upon each other is fundamental to Fuller's work. He feels that the resources, material and intellectual, of the entire globe must be made available to the total world population before any one man may enjoy their benefits with security and justice. The words Dymaxion, Geodesic, Tensegrity, Synergy, Aspension, all mirror his efforts to find the most efficient methods of dispensing these riches to mankind. The Fuller World was produced for National Educational Television by WGBH-TV, Boston. This is NET, National Educational Television.